if you go back 16 years ago, Intel had some pretty crappy CPUs. CPUs like the Pentium 4, the Pentium D, and the Celeron D. But the following year, they would release a series of CPUs that would earn a legendary status for their power efficiency, performance, and just how freaking much you could overclock them. That chip we are going to be looking at today is, of course, the legendary Core 2 Quad Q6600. Yes, you may ask, why look at the one of the lower clocked Core 2 quads? And, well, all of Intel's CPUs from this era have a secret. They can all be overclocked by changing the front side bus clock, which can even be done in software or even with tape. Yes, tape. I'm not even joking. So, what exactly makes the Q6600 so damn epic? Well, back in 2007, the Q6600, a 2.4 GHz quad core, was the same price as the E6850, a 3 GHz dual core. So, some people just went ahead and bought the Q6600 if they had the cash, as it was considered better for the future, and overclocked it to the moon! I'm serious, go look at the Q6600 clock speed records. Some guy managed to hit 5.1 GHz on one of these 2.4 GHz Q6600s with a locked multiplier. And because of its power efficiency, it was more efficient than AMD's offerings while having faster single core performance, which meant it was better for gaming. Although the AMD option was cheaper. So, let's take a look at the specifications of this bad boy and see why it was so great. So, the Q6600 was one of the first quad core CPUs in the Core 2 series of CPUs. So that means it had some low clocks versus the later Core 2 quads. The Q6600 has four cores and four threads that run at 2.4 GHz with a locked multiplier of 9. However, the front side bus speed can be changed to dramatically speed up the CPU. And because of how easy it is to do, all tests were done at 3.6 GHz. It has two times four megabytes of L2 cache. Wait, what? Two times four megabytes of cache? Yep. These Core 2 quads essentially were two Core 2 duos glued together. And it really was not much more advanced than that. The two separate core clusters communicated over the North Ridge, which means lots of latency. The stock FSB speed is 1066 megahertz, and all Core 2 duos were on the LGA 775 socket, other than laptop ones. And the CPU is 64 bit to boot, which means it actually has use in 2022. So now, with the history and specs out of the way, why don't we see how this epic piece of silicon performs today? So like usual, we have the bar graph of POWER to show relative performance in games. And one game we're adding is Bioshock Infinite, as it was on sale on Steam. I also decided to benchmark on my second monitor for reasons, so all of these tests were done at 900p. Now. Moving on, we have Minecraft, which ran really well at 60 frames per second. However, chunk loading could be a little slow, and lots of entities on screen could lower our frame rate into the 1% lows. 
Next up is Cross Out, and it ran very well at 108 frames per second with high settings, and it was overall a very enjoyable experience. Avorian ran just a little worse than Cross Out with 7 FPS and was completely unplayable unfortunately. I was honestly surprised as the on paper Avorian should be able to run fine but I guess not. BMNG ran decently well with 36 FPS and while on the most intensive Italy map traveling at high speeds or spawning in any more cars than just one would tank the FPS down heavily. Elite Dangerous ran great with 56 FPS on average, and I couldn't even notice anything was performing poorly unless I was landing at a station. Rocket League also ran really good with 60 FPS on average. Shadow of the Tomb Raider ran fine with 36 FPS on average, and given the performance I saw, it was a great experience in general, although locking it to 30 FPS could yield a better experience. And the last game on the list is the new one. Bioshock Infinite ran flawlessly, which I guess is, be, is to be expected of a game made to run on CPUs from this era. With 144 FPS on average, I'd say it ran great. I should maybe start benchmarking on my main monitor, which is 1080p, but hey, that's something that I can figure out in the future. So yeah, for being so old, it ran great. However, how does it work browsing on the internet these days? So given that this thing maxes out at 8 gigs of RAM, you can totally do multitasking and browse heavy web pages without issue. But how well can the Q6600 cope with the modern web? Well, quite well. Other than a weird bug with this motherboard's lack of sound card and the sound card I put in being not happy, I had a really good experience watching YouTube videos. 1080p 60fps videos played flawlessly without a single dropped frame, which was really quite impressive for hardware from 2007. Reddit ran great as well, and pretty much felt just as smooth and as responsive as my main rig, which is a huge compliment to this old silicon. Continuing the trend, your social media sites like Facebook and Twitter do run great as well, and I didn't see or feel any hitches to speak of while browsing these sites. eBay and Amazon load really fast, and searching for an item yields results very fast. Pretty much as fast as my desktop. So, at least to me, if you have an Intel CPU that is newer than a Pentium 4, and not an Atom, you're gonna have a pretty decent browsing experience with a dedicated graphics card. So, the Q6600. Still a good CPU today? Well, as long as you keep your expectations in check and shoot for more indie titles, totally. You can find these things dirt cheap online. And you can find a cheap respective pre-built and while those don't expose a front side bus overclock in the BIOS, there's actually software you can use to overclock these CPUs via the FSB. With that in mind, if you can find something like a GTX 1050 or something equivalent to that, you're gonna have a really good gaming experience for like 150 bucks, excluding your graphics card. Although, I'd honestly recommend LGA 1155 for better performance. Anyways, that's it. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video looking back at this legendary piece of silicon. 
Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button as I always upload on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Central Time. I also have Patreon, where videos come out 24 hours early, some exclusives, and behind-the-scenes stuff, including bloopers. Anyways, DDT, out.